Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin. My guest today is one of the calmest people I know, despite having a lot going on. She's the founder and CEO of Fuck Cancer, a nonprofit dedicated to early detection, prevention, and garnering support for people affected by cancer. After birthing her first child, she launched the judgment-free digital media community, Mother Lucker. And now, with two boys, age three and two, she's expecting a baby girl any day now, and she just became a senior advisor to the billion-dollar company, Bumble. Yael Cohen-Brown, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Boy, you're busy. (laughs) <laughs> That's such a nice introduction. Can uh, I put it on my wall? <laughs> for sure. I feel lazy by comparison. Uh, gosh, I want to know about everything. I want to know about where you came from and how you began all these uh, wonderful platforms and what pregnancy, childbirth, and motherhood has been like for you. Let's start at the beginning. Where are you from? I am from South Africa originally. South Africa. You grew up there? I was there until I was about nine years old. Oh, that's a, a long time. Yeah. Do you have memories? like? Of course. And we, when we go back often, most of our family is still there. Oh, you still have a lot of family in South Africa? Yeah, the majority. What was it like? I mean, it was... I was young enough that it was great. I think had I been older and understood what was happening in the country, I would have, you know, ran as my parents did. Pick up my kids and got the hell out of there. Where'd you go? Uh, we came to America first. We came to California mm-hmm. and then Colorado. And then Vancouver, settled in Vancouver. So a lot of moving around. Is that hard when you're that age? I think it was great. I mean, it was all I ever knew. But we moved countries every two years often, um, or, well, places every two years, us often countries. And I loved it. It made our nuclear family really, really tight because we were all we had. We knew that in two years, all of these friends, all these people would be gone and we'd have each other. Uh, It also taught my brother and I how to make friends and and be outgoing and you know um it forced us to be more resilient humans look you don't really have a choice (laughs) you don't have any choice you're outgoing or you're alone yeah (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) or eating lunch in the bathroom (laughs) so it's the two of you you have one one brother i have an older brother and uh now how long were you in canada for i was in canada for i mean my i i say most of my upbringing i was there for a good 10 15 years i should know that I was there for a long time. You're there for I called a while. it home. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's home for you. That's that's home now. Yeah. And your your family still lives there. Yes. Uh, Parents so, and brother. So you go back. Yeah. Or we lure them here. And um, so, what did you study? I started in pre med, and hated every second of it. And a friend of mine was in political science, and we'd study together. And I was so interested in everything he was doing. And I was like, sorry, this is what you're like studying for? <laughs> I was like, I'm learning organic chemistry and like hoping I don't, you know, fall off a cliff. <laughs> um, I remember organic chemistry, not pleasant. Oh, the worst. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's people that it's cut out for and people that it aren't. <laughs> I was not. But I think a lot of people, because, you know, when, when I was in that pre-med training cycle, a lot of people love to give and love to help but don't love organic chemistry. I don't and think so, anyone loves organic chemistry, but it weeds you out and it shows if you'll work for it. Exactly. And it definitely is a rite of passage to yeah. keep going. Lord help me. I got through that rite of passage, but did not want <laughs> to <laughs> keep didn't. going. Yeah. What did you originally want to do in healthcare? Um, I mean, from the time I was, I think, three, I wanted to be a pediatric cardiologist, a baby heart fixer. Whoa. Yeah. That's very specific. A for family friend's a <laughs> child was born without, uh, oh, with a hole in... Um, their heart and at three years old I was like I'm going to grow up and learn how to fix that I think actually my brother said it first and I was like me too (laughs) and then he moved on and I really stuck with it Uh, Um, for a a little while yeah until third year of college when I switched majors and went on semester at sea and switched to poli sci and decided I wanted to fix the system not the patients oh somebody still needs to fix the system yeah hey we're working on it Uh, yeah (laughs) so where'd you go from there um, I graduated and got offered a job in finance and <laughs> took it. That's totally different. So did not use my degree, um, but went into regulatory compliance for a publicly traded company, which was super interesting. And it, we, you know, I got the job at the top of the market. Four months later, the market crashed. We happened to have you know raised funds in that four months, so mm. we we're in a very good position. The company was in a unique unique position for. Um, for the crash, so it was actually I learned a hell of a lot. 
then my mom got sick. Yeah, so tell me about that. Um, so I, when I was 22, my mom got diagnosed with breast cancer. And my father and I were her primary caregivers. My, my brother lived in London at the time, else he would have been as well. And, you know. Were you living at home? No, I didn't. But I, I mean, I moved back. I mean, we lived like 30 minutes apart. So I would move back for weeks at a time when needed. We, she got treatment in the States. So we came down to, the, you know, we came down here for extended periods of time. Um, and then I started Fuck Cancer, which was born out of, by total chance, I had no intention of starting a charity. Uh, I made mom a shirt that said, Fuck Cancer. Just how we all felt. cheer her up or? I mean, it was just like the words at the tip of, like it was at the tip of your tongue at all times. It's all you were, you know, thinking and, and I didn't think she'd wear it. My mom is just like proper, appropriate, like little classy lady. <laughs> okay, that's totally how you strike me. <laughs> and so I think the first time I met you, I'm like, what do you do? You said, oh, I have this organization. I said, oh, tell me more about it. And you're like, it's called Fuck Cancer. And I almost <laughs> fell over. It like, made me uncomfortable. I almost made a joke that uh, I have an organization called Shit on Cancer. Uh, <laughs> just because I was so uncomfortable. And I was going to compete with Fuck Cancer. Um, but yeah, so she, but she did wear it. Everywhere. And it was people's responses that was, you know, part of the catalyst for, for starting the organization because total strangers would come up to her and people wanted to share their stories. They wanted to hear hers. They'd hug her. They'd cry. I mean, oh, wow. and it was, it was astounding. I think it takes a hell of a lot for a stranger to touch another stranger, but to share some of those really vulnerable moments and memories says a lot. You know, I think that people were looking for that vulnerability and that authenticity and that rawness um, and that war cry. And you were still like 20, 22 two. and she beat cancer. She did. And so how did that turn into an organization? Uh, it started with a Facebook page. I made a Facebook page called fuck cancer, mostly to tell my friends kind of what was happening. Cause I wasn't great at verbalizing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and it, you know, it was, I don't know if I did a great job if, you know, in writing either, but, um, I came back a few days later and we had a couple of thousand people in the group. Wow. I was like, I don't know a thousand, a couple of thousand people. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it wasn't your closest friends. It was, no. And it was people from all over the world and it was, and people were rallying around that war cry. Huh. And that paired with wanting to give back and wanting to turn that like pain into purpose and having participated in the cancer space in various ways for years as a fundraiser. When I, you know, I called up the organization I used to fundraise for, and I had re- I'd been one of their largest donors, fundraisers, as a child, cause, which is insane, because mm-hmm. I did a, an event for them. Every year, we did a charity fashion show, and I called up, and I was like, you'll never believe this. Mom has breast cancer. It was a breast cancer organization. I'd have no, impact. Wow. I'd have no relationship to cancer before that. And I said, what do we do? And the woman who I had raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for spent, you know, hours and hours and hours with said go to our website and so that was like a fuck you and fuck cancer moment seriously wow <laughs> and so it became really evident to me that if you weren't giving your money you weren't important and you weren't that's i didn't want people's money i wanted their time i wanted their brains i wanted their hearts and skills and so and beyond that i was young and so i wasn't taken seriously and i thought it was such a mistake to leave at the time millennials now I don't know what the hell they're called. Every they're always changing. Whatever generation the something. Yeah, <laughs> out of the conversation because we're not the ones that are getting cancer, but our parents are. Mm-hmm. And we're teaching our parents more than any generation ever has, and we're taking care of them when they're sick, and we're trying to keep them from getting sick. So fucking use us. Hmm. And that became the foundation of what you do. That became it. Focused on early detection, prevention, and psychosocial. I mean, it's psychosocial sounds so sterile, but um, heart, mind, soul, relationships, everything other than your body. How do you love and support somebody through cancer? How do you ask for the help you need when you are the patient? Not the like head tilt and I'm here if you need anything. The very specific, I'm going to get your kids from school. I'm, you know, there's groceries in the fridge. Let me walk the dog. How to actually be helpful. How to actually be helpful. Yeah. I mean, we have a, a friend who had, who went through breast cancer recently, but I also see patients who, who are knee deep in it. Sometimes massage is very helpful for them. Sometimes they don't like it at all. 
Um, but that's a common thread that happens over and over again as people say my friends were there right when I got diagnosed and then they just disappeared. And then even as a friend of someone with breast cancer, it's sort of like it's awkward. You don't know exactly what to say or what they need or what they want. Well, that's just and, it. It's awkward. You feel guilty, confused because we're not taught. We're taught to be uncomfortable. Patients are taught to wear headscarves or wigs, not because it's for them. It's itchy. It's uncomfortable. It's for us. It's because we get uncomfortable around in dealing with somebody else's pain that we can't fix. Hmm. So, and it's fuckcancer.com? Let's fcancer.com. Let's fcancer.org. Are there still fuck cancer shirts? Oh, yeah. At the website? Yep. Different colors for different cancers. Oh, wow. We have actually then about five years after I started it, or maybe three, I don't remember, three, four, five years after I started it, (laughs) (laughs) um, I started getting confused for a girl named Julie Greenbaum who was another Canadian Jewish girl who had started fuck cancer because her mom got cancer. She started her own fuck cancer? Yeah. We started around the same time. We did very different things. She threw events, and we did, you know, digital and, and on-the-ground programming. And initially, we, we met, and we were both too young, and we were like, we should do this together, except I do it this way, and you do it this way, and this is my logo, and that's your logo, and what <laughs> the hell are we going to do? <laughs> it took us a few years, but we actually got to a place where we merged, She's my co-founder. She's amazing. Um, and so we have been building together for years now. I mean, not 10 years. Both wow. of us started our own fuck cancer 10 years ago, and we merged maybe five my years ago. double fuck cancer. Double. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. Um, all right. Is there things just along, along those lines, or are there things that just an average person should do or should know? Um, about cancer, even if it doesn't affect them at all right now? I mean, there's so many things. I mean, there's, if you're looking at it from prevention, it's about lifestyle and stacking the cards in your favor. If you're looking at it from early detection, it's about knowing your family history. So what cancers you're at highest risk for and what the earliest warning signs are so that you can stay on top of annual diagnostics or, you know, or self-exams. And self-exams are not to look for something. I think that's a mistake people make. They don't do them because they're like, well, I'm young. I'm not at risk. It's knowing your body. So if something changes, you're the first to notice. You're aware of a change. Exactly. And then you can go see what that change is about. Yeah. The earlier, the better. Early detection is really the best cure we have right now. Um, and hopefully that'll change soon, too. And that'd be nice. Uh, all right. Moving on. Uh, you. When did you get married? I should know this. <laughs> Four years ago, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot has happened in yeah. that time period. <laughs> He's the romantic of the relationship. I th- We got married four and a half years ago. How did you meet? We met because he saw my TED Talk. Oh, what's your TED Talk? Was it on cancer? Yeah. Oh. It was my very first time public speaking. I was 22 years old. I was so nervous. <laughs> Uh, I can't say it was spectacular, but he seemed to think so. Uh-huh. <laughs> and we had a lot of mutual friends. He saw it online? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I want to see it. It must still be floating. I think it is. Yeah. I can't say I've looked at it in a long time. I'll search and link it to our <laughs> website. Um, he saw it, decided he needed to meet me, that I was I was the girl for him. And we had a lot of mutual friends, including his brother, who was one of my closest friends. Oh, really? Um, I was with somebody else at the time. His brother was like, leave her alone. <laughs> so we never met then. I, kn- I didn't know this until after. Um, and when I moved to L.A., we, I mean, it's a long story, but basically he tricked me into a first date where another, a mutual friend of ours was like, let's all get drinks. You're new to L.A. You need to know people. And only he showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Told me he was going to marry me our first date. I tried to run. <laughs> I ran for a little while. Because you're no longer with the, that other guy. Yeah, no, no longer. Well, he's very determined. He's, in he's the my perfect that he wants match. To do. <laughs> <laughs> he knew better than me. Um, and then you were not married very long before you popped out a kid. We were not. We knew we wanted, I mean, from, he was, he knew before I did, but from, you know, when we got serious, we got serious. We knew we wanted to be together and start a family. And we both are very close to our families and have had the luxury of like really beautiful family upbringings and wanted to have that of our own. And so we, you know, went for it as soon as we could. <laughs> <laughs> How um, did, what, were you, I mean, you got pregnant quickly then because um, you weren't together that long. Yeah. We, I mean, yes and yes and no. 
you know, we uh, had a miscarriage before Jagger. Mm. And then it felt like forever to get pregnant again, but it obviously wasn't. But and Miscarriage is another thing that is awkward for people to talk about. Incredibly. How far along were you when you found out? That I had miscarried or that I was pregnant? Both. We found out early that I was pregnant. Um and then flew our parents in to tell them. We were oh, so excited. It was no. the first grandchild. And um, and actually, when they were in town, it was about 11 weeks. Um, I ended up miscarrying while they were in town. After you already told them? The, the next day. We told them, yeah, the day before. And the next oh, night, wow. I ended up in the emergency room. In, ended up Because what did you feel? Honestly, I mean, at this point, after having chi- you know, children you knowing, I don't think I would have gone. But I I didn't have, I didn't know what to do. You know, I... I I didn't know where to go. I thought, if you go to the emergency room, maybe they can stop it, which mm-hmm. obviously... Did you see blood? It's, yes. Oh, and that's why you went to the emergency room? Mm-hmm. And then did they just tell you right away, this is... No, they didn't. They couldn't tell quite. It took... I mean, I was there for an hour. I was there for fucking 10 hours, maybe. Wow. Well, they were trying... You know, I mean, nothing moves fast in there. But you already I mean, saw a heartbeat before that. No. You had never seen her. I, I didn't even know you had to go to the doctor. <laughs> like, when you got pregnant, I was like, you just... Wait a second. So you, like, peed on a stick. Yeah. Said, but, like, hey, every week. Pregnant. Oh, every week. Yeah. To oh, make I sure you were still pregnant. Yeah. Okay. And so I, I think I was going to meet an OB, like, the next week. Because most of them won't see you. I don't even know. I, I, I didn't even know what I was meant to do. You know, we were just so excited. And we were trying really hard to keep it a secret. And so, you know, we, I didn't, we didn't, hadn't seen a doctor yet. Um, but you, I didn't know that you're meant to. I think there's a lot of stuff that you don't know your first time around. And, you know, I spe- we had just told our parents the night before. I'm sure if I had told my mother when, when I should have at the very beginning, she would have made me go see a doctor. Mm. You know, it's the stuff that, for the most part, I mean, in my case, my mom told me, teaches me. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people wait till 13, 14 weeks yeah. to tell even their parents. So. They normally yeah. tell the doctor first. That they one usually, would have been. They usually do <laughs> we did it a little backwards. We were out of our depth, to say the least. Yeah. So that must have been um, emotionally hard you know, to go through that little roller coaster after being on a stick every week. <clears throat> it was, I never could have imagined how the like, like, profound sense of loss you have with the miscarriage. Because before I had it, and, and even, you know, having had pregnancies before it, uh, like it, ne- hereafter, you f- you can't understand that the minute you find out you're pregnant, in your mind you're a mom. You mm-hmm. are like the vessel of something so precious. Nobody else knows or sees or feels it, but you lost you something, and you lost the idea of a life you thought you'd have. And I think that morning we don't give people enough space to mourn that. We you know we expect them to you'll get pregnant again soon, which is like I mean the most dismissive thing I think you can say which is so well intentioned well it's, a, it's just more of a logical and practical but not taking into it. account it, it's it's a fix it it doesn't take into account at all the heavy emotions that are loaded in there and and it's it's a big journey you know it's a big journey we also went we had some miscarriages as well um, and uh, thank you and it just um, it was such a big journey um, and I also see people who sometimes have two or three kids and then have even a very early miscarriage at six weeks and it hit some heart, you know, yeah. eight weeks. So, um, well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, did you talk to your friends about it? So that's actually part of how Mother Lucker started, is that I, I, I had a few girlfriends, you know, I, I like went underground. I didn't. I, I wasn't going out. I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't really responding to calls or texts. And a few good girlfriends called or showed up at my door and were like, we don't know what's wrong, but like something's wrong. This is not you. And it just so happened that two of them had had miscarriages and both of them have beautiful, happy children. And, you know, them talking me through, you know, what happened with them and 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 coming out on the other side. And, you know, was the only thing that really helped, to be honest. Wow. Um, and so it was this idea that, and then, you know, after the fact, that I know so many women who have miscarriages and nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about it. It's very rare to have a conversation about it. And you're so alone because you, you oftentimes haven't told anybody that you're even pregnant. That's the hard so. part. And so the next time we got pregnant, the rule was, 
we we told the people early on that we would want to tell if we lost another baby mm-hmm. that would that would want that, to lean on them and love them and um but learning that people just don't talk like understanding that how hush hush it is was part of that's why I started Mother Lucker I wrote about it I thought I I wish that somebody had I wish I'd known before so Mother Lucker started before Jagger um. Well, no, the foundations of it. Yeah, you I, started, wrote about I, it I wrote about it then, but I never put it out. Oh, yeah. Um, and then people. I mean, I Scott would always say to me, we'd be at like the Grammys or some glamorous event, and I'd end up in the corner talking to someone's wife who was point who I'd never met before, who was pouring their heart out. And he said, "Why do people tell you their secrets, whether it's cancer or miscarriages?" And I said, "Because I let them. I gave them a safe space with no judgment and and like an empathy." Which is, I think, all we're looking for. It's, I mean, that's hard to find in general, but for some reason, it seems twice as hard to find in the mother space. People are so judgmental. I was going to say it's because the judgment clouds everything. Yeah, but why? Like, it's it's a it's sort of like even pregnancy. You would think if normally you get four feet of personal space, then we should give you eight feet. But all of a sudden, it becomes like okay to just reach out and touch your belly, even if I've never met you before, and say things that are very personal. I, I just don't understand it, like, logically, how that happens. And the judgment around everything, pregnancy, postpartum, motherhood, parenting, it seems like a magnifying glass for judgment. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think it's really unfortunate that we're our cruelest when people are their most vulnerable. Agreed. So, Mother Lucker, uh, you know, a platform that's built on non-judgment in that space is uh, is probably a, a savior for a lot of people i mean i wrote what i wish people had told me or the things that people told me in private you know mm-hmm. so everything from about miscarrying to about judgment to about guests and in-laws and like sleep training and whatever all the shit that we judge you know or that we question or that we're embarrassed to talk about i talked about all of it because nobody's perfect no parent is perfect and they're pretending to be there <laughs> they're worse than any of us right. um and people's response was really beautiful. And I realized very early on, I have one perspective, and I've only done this at that time for <laughs> two years. I have no idea what I'm talking about. So I brought in contributors who mm-hmm. had, you know, it was special needs moms and single moms and divorced moms and multiracial moms and older, later in life moms and, you know, adoptive moms and all of these unbelievable women who had done this for a long, long longer than I had. And it had very different experiences talking about their views and experiences and everything from what not to say to somebody whose child has special needs to how not to ask if a child is adopted to the crazy ass shit that we say to people Mm -hmm. about their children. Um, I thought it was needed and we got a really, really great response. And it was, again, it was very similar to fuck cancer and that it was community building and it was giving people the three things they just really want when they are emotionally compromised or when they're out of their depths trying to figure something out. And that is, a community, information without judgment, and a voice. They want to feel heard. Everybody also wants to feel that their experience is important, and especially new moms. Yeah, it's beautiful. And you you just tapped into two communities where it's so necessary and and limited. There's a lot of odd parallels between the two communities. Yeah. Uh, so then you got pregnant again. Yes, with Levi. And um, how was that pregnancy? How did you find out? And how many times did you piano stick? Oh, my goodness. Well, that time I went straight to the damn doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and he let me, I love my doctor. He's so, so he let me come every week because <laughs> I needed to see that heartbeat. Um, and he was so sweet about it. I'd be like, I'm just going to pop in for a quick ultrasound. <laughs> I'm just going to pop in quick and see you. But you were just here an hour ago. Yeah. yeah. He, would, he let me literally come every week. He was so sweet about it. He knew that it was just what I needed. Um, we found out early because we'd been trying. Uh-huh. Um, I actually took Jagger on tour <laughs> with Scott. <laughs> Scott had to be on tour and we were trying and it, and I was like, I'm not, I'm not missing a month. We're, we're coming with. <laughs> so, um, we came on tour for a couple of weeks. This is, oh, this is you. you okay. You went on Scott. Scott on was on tour, tour for work. With Scott and you went with him so you wouldn't not be in the same Yeah, city. so I wouldn't miss like ovulation. <laughs> this is a month. Wow, that's intense. <laughs> and yeah, Jagger liked the tour of us and we, it, I mean, he wasn't in school yet and we could do it and we had really been trying. It wasn't easy this the second time. It took us a lot longer and we had to get some help and I wasn't, I just, you know, you get 
a little frantic, I think, about it. I did, at least, when you want it so badly and it's not happening. Yeah. I mean, it's a month seems like a long time then. Yeah. I mean, it took eight or nine months, I think, in total. Which is totally within the norm. Exactly. But, you know, once you're ready and your body's not, it's hard to accept. It's, it's a roller coaster. Yeah. How was your first pregnancy um, compared to what you thought it would be like? Oh, man. Um I think it was good. I was working. I was also doing a fellowship at Stanford at the time. So I was commuting on Monday mornings. I'd fly to Stanford and on Thursday nights I'd fly home or I'd fly to work because I was also shooting something and I'd work on the weekends. So I worked. I always do. Actually, I work more when I'm pregnant always. I feel like I need to like get it in before the baby comes. <laughs> um, so it was fine. I mean, I, I get really, really sick in the beginning, which is not great, but it was safe. And that's all, you know, I was so grateful to be pregnant that the nausea, even though I want to die with that nausea every time, I wasn't nauseous the first time. Uh, you were not nauseous miscarried. with the miscarriage. Uh, and so, so I'm always a little grateful the nausea for it. A little bit. Yeah. Um, do you throw up as well or just nausea? No, I just cry hugging the toilet. <laughs> oh, I'm hoping to throw up, yeah. but you, you don't. It's delightful. And all I eat is bread, bagels and bread. Mm. That part is actually delightful. (laughs) It's one thing we have in common. (laughs) Uh, And then through the growth of the pregnancy, I mean, your body changed a lot. How was that for you? Uh, I think the first time it's so exciting. I mean, you're anxious and there's like a little bit of terror in every twinge because you don't know. So you're so aware. I knew knew what fruit he was at every day, you know? (laughs) Now people are like, when are you doing? I'm like, oh, God, I think next month. I don't don't know. Cantaloupe. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. She kicks a lot. That's all I know. (laughs) She'll come when she comes. Um, You know, so there's something really special to the first time, obviously. It's, I mean, your body's insane. It does these insane things and grows a human. And the first time you feel a kick and, you know, the first time you see them on the ultrasound and all of those are magic. But then when you don't feel the kick and you're terrified and, you know, the first time you're, I was, I was a little crazy. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, but I think especially after having that surprise miscarriage, you just get double in tune with what is that? How come something's not happening? You know? And because you don't know what it's meant to feel like. Yeah. So every time something you're like, is that right? Is that what it's meant to feel? You know, and then you start getting the pains and the, the, you know, everything gets uncomfortable and, but it's all worth it. Did you think about what you wanted from your birth experience? Not enough my first time. So my first time, I just knew I didn't want a C-section as it was medically essential for the baby or I. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, that was all I really knew. I, I wanted it to be like minimal medical intervention, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't looking for a home birth. I wanted to be in a hospital and I knew very little about anything else. And Did you take classes or read books? No, nope. I mean, I read else? every book, but I didn't. I, yeah, I have like a <laughs> pile of like, like 40 okay. books. <laughs> yeah. Um, but a lot more of it was about pregnancy, things to do, things not to do, what's normal, what's not, your options when it came to labor in terms of the baby, you know, the um, eye drops and the... Oh, the things after, yeah, right after the baby comes exactly, out. Exactly, those decisions. But it didn't talk too much about, you know, some of the medical interventions that might happen without you even knowing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wasn't, I I wasn't as educated as I would have liked to be. And I think only after meeting you the second time did I get really, not only, you know, certain of what I wanted, but uh, bold in my assertion. Mm -hmm. You know, you, I mean, you changed my second labor. I tell everyone (laughs) (laughs) my first and second labor were night and day. And my second labor would have been exactly the same had it not been for you. Oh, wow. And I met you towards the end. I mean, like three weeks before he came. It was crazy. So how how was it different? What did you want to, to be different once you sort of learned more about what the possibilities were? You know, so when the second time I went to, the, uh, when, when, when I was pregnant with Levi, our second child, went to the doctor for my regular checkup. He was like, oh, you're in labor. I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> He's like, no, that's not a question. I'm telling you're in labor. You're having a baby today. I was like, no. I, he's like, well, go home. You'll call me later. Go ahead. So I left. I went home. I think my mom and I got lunch and like a manicure, you know, repacked my hospital bag, hung out, went to sleep, woke up the next morning. He was like, I'm surprised I didn't see you. Come see me. So that maybe 9 a.m. And so I went, he said, bring your hospital bag. Okay. <laughs> so I went over to see him. He's like, you're in labor. We're going to the hospital. I said, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going. Because I, I, I wasn't feeling 
an idiot. And I really didn't want to, you know, when we had talked, you had told me things like when you go to the hospital, it, labor progresses or the, you know, or the shakes or all those things start because it's the environment as mm-hmm. well. Um, and I just wasn't ready. I didn't feel like my body was ready. So he, I said, no, I'm not going to the hospital. He said, well, you can't cross, <laughs> you can't go across town. You have to stay close to the hospital. So I got a hotel room right across the street and I called you. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and I like ordered waffles. We did some body work. And then we went for like a two and a half hour walk. Went for a great walk. It was honestly, I mean, it was the best thing ever. And had I been sitting, those contractions in that two and a half hours would have felt like the longest, worst two and a half hours ever. Um, but I think it was what I needed. It was my body needed. And then by the time, you know, we went to the hospital, he was out in eight minutes. Wow. It was my, I was ready. My body was ready. Like it was just different. But had I gone the night before, my body wasn't ready. Right. You know, so there would have been Pitocin. There would have been a whole bunch of things. I would have been there for, you know, in my head, I would have had a, what, 24 hour labor, but I didn't need it. And that's what I had the first time I went, you know, when my, like medically, I was ready to be admitted. But I didn't need to be. I would say also that was like one of those really powerful during the walk, a really powerful transition that I saw from you where, you know, once your surges started to get more intense, stronger, more productive, um, your initial response a little bit was to like fight them. You're a little fighter. (laughs) And so (laughs) I would see like kind of like scrunching your face and, and almost like pushing away from it. Um, and I think it was just like simple things like smiling. You know, you said to me, and I tell it to everyone, you said you're in pain, not danger. And it like radically shifted my view of childbirth because it's, that's exactly it. And you said, stop fighting it. You taught me how to like breathe into it and with it, which sounds really hard and it is really hard. But, you know, the, my natural instinct, and I think most of ours is to like clench and tighten and fight. And you're like, oh, this hurts. And I don't mm-hmm. want this to happen. But ultimately, all of those, that, that pain, those contractions are bringing you closer to your child. And when you stop fighting it and you can breathe with it and you can, you know, I, it just changed my perspective. Pain, not danger. It's literally what I said with every contraction. You know, they tell you to have a mantra. It's like, pain, not danger. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's powerful because you're a fighter because you fight things that are, that your body naturally says, what is this? I yeah. don't know what this is. But as soon as you told yourself, this is not danger then you let go of any anxiousness or fear around it. And um, it was just really powerful. I would see you start to smile during your surges, and it was a whole different... There was no more pushing you know, away from it and trying to get away from it. It was just letting it happen. We're doing it again this time. <laughs> is, that, is that the goal? So that's what I was going to ask you. What's the plan for, for number three? I mean, I don't know if I'll have as much time with number three. I hear it can go... You never know? Yeah, I hear it can be a, a quick one. But that's my goal is the same. I want to be... You know, it's just about being in a position of control and knowing more now and knowing when I can speak up when, they, you know, when things would happen or I wasn't comfortable. I was so scared of making the wrong decision for my child that I didn't realize that it was just as dangerous to make the wrong decision for me. Mm, that's powerful. Has pregnancy felt different with a girl? I don't know if it's a girl or just the third one close together and chasing two crazy boys. <laughs> yeah. Um, most of it actually has been fine and really quick. I mean, in the beginning, I'm always sick. But it goes faster because you don't get to think about, you know, it as much. You're trying to stop your two boys from, you know, jumping off the coffee table into a window or whatever it may be. <laughs> that boys do. Uh, but it's the end is is more uncomfortable, I'd say, because she, she's dropped earlier. Yeah, she did drop pretty early. Yeah. So now it's like I waddle everywhere. It's cool. I look great. <laughs> well, you, you make waddling look cool. <laughs> if it's, yeah. Um, how about uh, for each of the kids after you had them? So, like, the transition to motherhood and feeding a baby and caring for a baby. That first transition is so hard. I think that was, I mean, I just had no idea what to expect. Um, I, my, our, both Scott and my folks live um, out of town, so we don't have family in town. I'd always worked, and so... W- I didn't, we didn't hire any help because I thought I'm on maternity leave. This is my full-time job. Like, what else am I going to do? This is the most natural thing in the world. (laughs) I was fucking miserable. I was so out of my depth. I was terrified. Anytime he made a noise, I didn't know what to do. I wouldn't let anyone hold him. I was, I, I'd never, I wasn't like a baby person before. I was out of my depth. I was anxious. I was, you know, Scott was traveling a lot for work and I didn't, I, I needed a community. I needed a tribe. 
on, I only really settled into motherhood when I found my, I mean, who to this day are still some of my best friends, new moms who are in the same situation, who are, you know, as we were texting each other questions or ridiculous shit that had happened or, you know, it, just company. I mean, we literally, we would have play dates where at any of our houses and we'd feed the kids and we'd bath them together and take, it was like this community this tribe and i understand why every culture in history has done that this issue of affluence and isolation is difficult we don't have to live with our families anymore but that means we don't get to live with our families anymore that's really profound and that's what I say every day, and that's what we experience with our own families, is that, you you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child, and it does. It absolutely takes um, a village. And we don't have it anymore, because we don't live with the village anymore. Yeah. So now it's sort of recreated through all these, like, professions, like doulas and childbirth educators, night nurses, nannies, and postpartum doulas. Um, but that's but friends is like, that's the closest thing you get to. Yeah. You know, people say their village is prenatal yoga. <laughs> I yeah. believe it honestly, and whenever people say what you know, what should I do? I'm like, find your village, whatever that is. Yeah. Whether it's at baby group or yoga or the freaking supermarket, like you find your people, and it just feels a lot less isolating and scary when you do, you know. And there's so much with that comes with new motherhood. Not only does your life change in an instant, but nobody else's does, and that's hard too to watch the world go on while you feel like we should all be stopped right now, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and then there's, you know, breastfeeding and like all of these other complex issues that everybody has their own, you know, complexities with. Was breastfeeding challenging for you? Or? Um, I got really lucky both times and I'm hoping not one that is that way the next. And, yeah. um, no, and I, you know, I love it. I'm one of the, the, the weird ones who I, I mean, I truly love nursing. I love cuddling with them. I love that time. And actually probably the Levi, our second more than our first, only because, you don't get that much alone time with your second kid, uh-huh. you know? Or And so it was this, like, that special time that I knew every, whatever, two, three hours. <laughs> every <laughs> That's our alone time. <laughs> four minutes, we were going to be cuddling for an uh-huh. hour. Um, I love it, and it works for me, but it's not for everybody. Yeah. It's also, that's true that it's not for everybody, but it's also some people really struggle with that transition, yeah. and it's a big learning curve, and for other people, it's just latch and go. I think it's, I mean, it depends on the kid, it depends on your body, it depends on so many things. I, it also, I think, depends on your perspective. I have a lot of friends who went into it and were like, that is not, it, it's weird, it's not for me. Uh-huh. I didn't get breastfed, or, you know, I don't want to do it. And, like, we all make our own decisions. I think, yeah. like, we have to stop judging and asking and trying to figure out what someone else is doing so we can feel validated in what we're doing. Well, what would I do with my free time if I didn't troll moms on, on social media? <laughs> You'd uh, have more kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Maybe that's why I do it. Uh, let's uh, just talk a little bit about this new position you picked up. Um, you're a senior advisor on Bumble. Yes, sir. What's the plan? You know, um, Whit, their, Whit Wolf, Wolfhard, their founder, is a friend, and I think she's brilliant. I think that Wit and consequently Bumble, because their company you know, follows in her footsteps, they always do the right thing, whether it's good for their bottom line or not. Mm-hmm. And I respect that. It's, they are focused on female-led connections and empowerment and not just dating. It started with dating, but they have BFF and biz, so it's about finding friends and your community and your tribe. Your village. Exactly. Um, and finding jobs and, and work opportunities without getting hit on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that they're shifting paradigms and they're creating real safe spaces again for a lot of these conversations to happen and I wanted to be a part of it. Oh, it sounds like there's um, a lot of potential there. And it kind of falls right into Mother Lucker. Yeah, I think it falls into the, you know, the idea of community building, which is ultimately was being at the core of what I did with Fuck Cancer and Mother Lucker. Well, that's a lot. I opened by saying that you're like really calm and you are you have a calming effect on me oh thank you um but Tell my you, husband that okay i will <laughs> and you have a ton going on and uh you're about to add to that so i'm excited to see how this third one goes for you oh me too you need to tell me all the tricks i will tell you i've met your kids i, I want all your tricks all you've done tricks? it right oh hang out with my wife that's where the honestly tricks are. Set, let's set that up we are so my kids and I are so lucky to have her as our wife and mother. She's just incredible. She's a miracle. I mean, she is talk about a powerhouse. People would say, like, how do you do everything you do? 
I'm like, I do it because I have an amazing wife. How do you do what you do? <laughs> and I would say the same to you. Um, all right. Thanks so much for sharing such honest and open dialogue um, about a lot of topics that uh, some of them didn't even expect to talk about. But um, they're topics that need to be discussed. So I appreciate you for doing it. Well, thanks for having me. Where can we find you online? I mean, where online? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Where's a good place to follow your adventures? Um, Instagram is where I do most of it. I mean, I go through ebbs and flows of if I post or not, but just at Yale, Y-A-E-L. How do you pronounce it? I say Yale. I know it's Yale. Where I know every, what are your everyone parents who's say? Jewish wants to call me Yale. Yay. I mean, anyone anyone close to me calls me yay. So, yay? Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yay or nay. Um, thanks again for being here and at home thanks for listening if you have a topic you'd like us to discuss send us an email to info at informedpregnancy.com Doctor, doctor Give me the news I got a whole lot of questions for you